Welcome to another GTHL preview show. Thomas West alongside Liam Crothers. And today we are bringing you the Toronto Marlies, a team that was very strong this year with an innate scoring touch. Yeah, and they finished second overall in the GTHL standings. We'll get into that in a bit. And then they were able to push into a deep playoff series before the season, unfortunately, was put on hold. But we're going to get into why they were able to be successful in both the regular season and the postseason, looking at the forward lines, looking at the defense, and of course, looking at the goaltenders. Let's do just that, and let's start with the lines for the Toronto Marlies and the scoring ability, their centers, uh, very strong line, and it reflected how good they were. I mean, McDonnell can score, Barlow can score, Coughlin can score, Nichols can score, Cascagna can score. I mean, just so much of this forward depth was able to put the buck in the back of the net consistently, and then on the back end, Bertucci and M were great defensively, Deleche and Sandu as well. And then between the pipes, Joey Costanzo had a very good regular season and he carried that momentum into the postseason. He was impressive all year long. Yeah, and for me personally, their ability to put the puck in the back of the net was the most impressive thing for me. Would you agree with that? I would say so. And as I mentioned earlier, I mean, every single forward on this group was capable of putting the puck into the back of the net in a variety of scenarios. Colby Barlow is the first guy that I would look at because the consensus top five pick, I mean, no matter where that guy goes, you're getting an innate score, almost like an Austin Matthews. Those are lofty expectations, but you can see why the comparisons have been made. He can score in front of the net with tips. He can score with a shot he can score on the power play I mean he's even a little bit effective on the penalty kill as well which is something interesting for goal scorers yeah certainly very diverse and his play and his value to the team was reflected on the standings as they finished second in the GTHL just behind the Toronto Junior Canadians uh, a game that actually came down to a tiebreaker at the very end of the year those teams were neck and neck the whole year let's flip it over to the myhockey.com rankings uh, this is a little bit different here. It is, and this uh, ranking system is devised, and it really looks at strength of tournament schedules. So you look at the Toronto Marlies, they finished fourth overall uh, amongst all the teams listed here. And I mean, the separation between uh, the Toronto Titans at the top of the list and the Marlies is very, very slight. I mean, you look at the that rating point system, both at 97, but the difference comes in the tenths decimal point. They were so, so good. I mean, one of, that, uh, one of the reasons is most likely average goals. Um, and they allowed one or and they uh, goal differential. They had an average differential of 1.68 in the games that they played. The strength of schedule you see they had uh, this one of the strongest, if not the strongest. I mean, out of all the teams that have been listed here, that came under some tough competition, but they were able to pull through. We looked at their scores. They're a big reason why. Yeah, and in 2019-20, they were a tough team to play against. Uh, their strength was putting the puck in the back of the net. But this is a team that really needed to stay out of the box. And it was. And there are a couple of players that you can look to on the forward core that maybe exasperated things in certain scenarios where maybe you'd advise against that. Angus McDonnell did take quite a few penalties this year. Ryan Nichols, he uh, racked up some pims for himself as well. Nathaniel McDonald is a massive body on the ice, but he's also a massive body in the penalty box because he spends so much time there. Yeah, and, and that just speaks to the physical presence and the difficulty in playing against the Toronto Marlies. Yeah, and they make life difficult, and it's it's really fun to watch the way that they try to get in their opponents' heads because they'll spend some time in the box, but they'll spend some time celebrating goals as well. As we switch over to the draft predictions, and this is one of our favorite parts of the show because we get our input on the games that we have been watching these teams so far. So far, we'll start off with yours. Barlow and Bertucci, the two guys I have going in round one. I mean, I mentioned that already, the talent that they have there. I've got McDonnell, Nichols, Costanzo, and Grisolia in rounds two to three. I've got Codlin, Deleche, McDonald, Sandu, and Castagna, four to seven. And then from there, M, Hagiwara, Georgie, Steven, and Nikitopoulos, 13 to 15. I want to bring your attention to that four to seven because I suspect those to be early fourth round picks. It's unlikely that any of these players will be able to fall to the seventh round before a team scoops them up. And even in two to three, I expect that to be mainly top heavy. It wouldn't surprise me to see Coglin or Deleche maybe even sneak into the later half of the third round. Yeah, and I know Angus McDonnell is going to be a guy who we're going to disagree on, as I'm going to have my prediction in just a moment. You have him in the second round here, as I will have him in the first. I do, and maybe uh, the only reason that I have him in that spot is the the agitation factor that he brings. We had mentioned the penalties. He was the first guy that I mentioned spending time in the penalty box. That's an edge that some teams like and some teams don't, and we'll see what management decides to do. Is that a player that you think you can mold into an effective agitator, like a Brad Marchand, or does that begin to affect his game to the point where he's spending too much time in the penalty box? Yeah, certainly a guy that will be an elite talent at the OHL level, depending on where he goes. We switch over to my rankings now. I have Christopher Grisolia, Colby Barlow, and Angus McDonnell as the top round picks, as these were some guys on the Barleys this year that could really find the back of the net, and they were 
very valuable to that team. Tristan Bertucci, Ryan Nicholson, and Jonathan Castagna. These are guys that I see going pretty early in the second round. Castagna has an elite shot. Nichols' speed and his ability to play with just about anybody is going to definitely translate to the OHL level. Tristan Bertucci, a guy who you had in the first round, but I think there's a few defenders that are going to be above him in this OHL draft, and him being a defensive might push him down a little bit as well. Obviously, Coglin, DeLecce, Emin Costanzo as well could potentially be the first goalie drafted. Let's talk about Bertucci as well. You have him in the first round. What do you see in him? I think it's can't miss defensive potential. And I think the fact that he played on a Toronto Marlies team that was strong in the 2019 20 season is going to lead a lot of scouts to believe what they saw in those games. And I mean, coming up, he was touted as well. Um, there are a couple defensemen, obviously, in that group that could also go first round. So we'll see what the OHL teams decide to do. But I think with Bertucci, you're getting a leader. He spent the 2019 20 season as the captain. And it's always good to have a steadying presence like that on the back end because he can really rally the team when things get tough but he can also produce some offense it's always nice to see a defense from an offensive touch as we switch things over to the goaltending side of things a guy that we highlighted as potentially being one of the first goalies selected in the OHL draft Joey Costanzo and I think his positioning on both of our draft boards has nothing to do with his talent more so the trend that we see in the OHL I mean Costanzo is a big mobile goaltender. He's got great fundamentals. He cuts down the angles really well. He's always in good position to make saves. And uh, I think his reaction is something great as well because that makes him able to make any second or third saves he might have to make. And I mean, he's got a really important net presence. It is scary coming up against a guy that looks like a Stanzo standing in between the pipes. Okay, time for us to give our input once again on some of these Toronto Marlies games, which we've been able to watch. Some picks that may have a little bit more value than where they're actually getting selected. I'm going to start with Ryan Nichols, and you may say, well, Liam, you mentioned him a couple times already. How is he your player spotlight? Well, I think he's got more talent than I uh, than we've given him credit for to this point. He excels regardless of who's around him. He's successful no matter who his line mates are. He's got a great deal of individual skill. He can create plays by himself. So no matter where he goes, no matter who he plays with, he's going to be effective. That's a guarantee. Yeah, he absolutely is. I'm going to move a little bit further down in the draft rankings, and I'm going to pick a guy who has a lot of talent and a guy who has a lot of size. And I believe that that is going to really translate at the OHL level. It's Nathaniel McDonald, one of the biggest guys on the ice every time he's out there. He's a physical presence. And I think whatever OHL team, it may not be in the top couple of rounds that he gets drafted, but whichever team picks him and if he gets a chance to play at the OHL, I think a lot of fans are going to have fun with the kind of play style that he brings to the game. We got a bit of a contrast there in the players that we spotlighted, and I think Nichols uh, is higher up on some draft boards, even ours, than uh, Nathaniel McDonald, but I think they both uh, bring different elements to the table. I like that you mentioned uh, McDonald because size, it always translates. You can't teach it, and he's a really imposing presence out on the ice, and he's difficult to play against. It's no fun being a 5'10 a or a six foot forward trying to enter the zone when a guy like him is back checking because you're going to get hit into the boards, and it's going to hurt. How many times can you withstand that? That's what remains to be seen. Yeah, boy, is he ever physical. He'll be fun to watch at the OHL level if he gets there. Uh, let's switch over now to a bit of a team topic. Now, not every year you're going to come back with the same team. So let's take a look at some of the players that are moving. Uh, Alexander Steven, he's going to be a guy who's leaving the team this year. Marcelo Giorgi, two guys who played some versatile roles in the team. Kei Hagiwara and Nathaniel McDonald and Andreas Nikitopoulos, the backup goaltender this year. Uh, all leaving the team. Yeah, and Steven's an interesting player because he plays both forward and defense. We saw that versatility, and the Mississauga Sens would have been looking to implement that. Georgie, an effective forward as well. Hagiwara's skill set, I think, would have meshed really well with the Vaughn Kings because he's got an effective play style in along the boards, and you know, he's got a good bit of talent to him as well in terms of his hands. Nathaniel McDonald, Darcy Tucker would have loved him and his size. And Andreas Nikitopoulos, as a solid backup goaltender, might have fought for a starting spot with the Markham Majors. Yeah, Steven as well might have a bit bigger role going over to a team with the Senators too, which could be a positive impact of him. Let's move over now to the players that are joining the team. And this team certainly doesn't get weaker with the names we are seeing right here. Teo Artichuk, who is a star for the majors this year, he's coming over. And Selmo Rago joining as well. Stephen Campbell, Brandon Scott, a strong de defender. And Dirk Cole as well is coming in for the goaltending side of things. Well, a rich get richer here. Teo Artichuk, Anselmo Rago, and Stephen Campbell were all top forwards on the team 
that they had played for before they would have tried to come to the Marlies and play uh, in the season that has since passed us. And I mean, they all would have made an impact effectively. They're all effective forwards. Brandon Scott, you mentioned, he was a very solid blue liner for them. I'm sure he would have been implemented well. And Derek Cole, it would have been interesting to see how he would have battled for a starting spot in net. Now we see there was a lot of talent on this Toronto Marlies team, but Unfortunately, a lot of that talent wasn't able to play every night as it was a team that was really plagued with injuries and suspensions. And that was a lot of the reason that they weren't able to finish in that top spot in the GTHL. Just two games in the regular season, the Marlies were able to start with their complete lineup that they would have liked to have on the opening night. And they averaged about four call-ups every single time they played a game uh, throughout the playoffs. So that's obviously something that's a, a real big challenge that the Toronto Marlies had to contend with. And in that final game where they were looking for the top spot in the GTHL, the tiebreaker game, they were missing seven players in their lineup. So uh, an, a remarkable season considering they were able to do so well for the Toronto Marlies. Well, that does it for us here on the Draft Preview Show. This one from the Toronto Marlies as we get you set for the upcoming OHL Draft from Thomas West and Liam Crothers. We'll see you next time.